Good morning, Günaydın and Kalimera to everyone. Uh, this is the second day of talking to Cyprus Issue Together Conference. Uh, and we are in the session three. And this session is titled as International Politics and Security. If you follow the event yesterday, uh, there was a fruitful discussion uh, on both by the uh, representatives of two communities on Cyprus negotiations and on the second session on maritime disputes uh, in Eastern Mediterranean. And we expect same uh, lively discussions uh, also today in the both sessions that we are going to have. Uh, we are, this session is going to be followed by another session on uh, energy-related issues. Today, again, we have uh, very respected, experienced, and knowledgeable speakers on the Cyprus issue, Greek-Turkish relations. Uh, first, I would like to introduce the speakers to you, then uh, we will move on to uh, the session and speakers. First of all, uh, Nasu Huslu, Professor Dr. Nasu Huslu, uh, is the Vice Rector of uh, Istanbul Sabahattin Zayim University and a member of the Department of Political Science and International Relations. Uh, he has BA in International Relations from Faculty of Political Science at Ankara University, MA in International Relations from Birmingham University, UK, and PhD uh, from uh, Durham University, uh, again in the UK. He has uh, research and publications on Turkish-American relations, Turkish foreign policy, American foreign policy, and Middle Eastern politics. Uh, he has a book titled Cyprus Question as an Issue of Turkish Foreign Policy and Turkish-American Relations. He recently uh, translated uh, very important English textbooks into Turkish, namely William Hale's Turkish Foreign Policy book. Uh, and I think uh, his Turkish book on Turk-American ilişkilerinde uh, Kıbrıs and Çatlak İttifak 1947'den günümüze Türk-American ilişkileri are uh, must reads for uh, all Turkish students in Turkish universities. Our second speaker uh, will be uh, Dimitrios Triantafilou. He is a member of uh, faculty in Department of uh, Political Science, sorry, Department of International Relations at Kadir Has University in Istanbul. He has BA in Political Science and History from University of California at Berkeley. He has uh, MA in Law and Diplomacy from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and again PhD from the same school in International relations. Again, he is a very well-known figure in Turkey and Greek circles and international academia. He has been working on Greek foreign policy, international security, Turkish foreign policy, Greek-Turkish relations, EU foreign policy, EU neighborhood policy. Our third speaker will be, again, one of the hosts of this event, Professor Dr. Uh, Ahmed uh, Sozen, uh, one of our partners. Uh, he is uh, he is former uh, vice rector of Eastern uh, Mediterranean University and head of Department of Political Science and International Relations at Eastern Mediterranean University. He has BA from Bosphorus University, MA in International Relations from Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs from Syracuse University, and PhD in Political Science from University of Missouri, Columbia. Ahmed Sozan has been very active in uh, peace negotiations, peace building and democratization efforts in the island of Cyprus. He has been publishing and working on Cyprus issue. He's one of the leading experts. Foreign policy, Turkish foreign policy issues are also his uh, other areas of research. Our last speaker will be, again, uh, is a friend of us, uh, Professor Neofitos Loizides. Uh, we used to call him Neo, so I will uh, direct him as Neo afterwards. Neo uh, has BA from uh, University of Pennsylvania, MA from Central European University, and PhD from University of Toronto. Uh, he is a professor in conflict analysis at University of Kent, again, United Kingdom. He worked in Queen's University Belfast, where we were together at the same time, uh, and Princeton Universities. He has fellowships, he had fellowships in University of Essex and Kennedy School of Government. He has been uh, also one of the leading experts and working on the issues of uh, power sharing in deeply divided societies. He has been lecturing and writing on, the, on these issues, nationalism, Cyprus issue, and peace and conflict studies. So without uh, further ado, uh, we should uh, begin our session. 
just one sentence. As we understood yesterday, uh, when we were talking about maritime disputes in the Eastern Mediterranean, all issues uh, are directed towards the issues of international politics and security. This underlines the importance of today's session. Probably we will talk about uh, energy, and when we are talking about energy, we are going to refer to international politics and security dimension again. And energy issue cannot be taught also without the security dimension of it. So here we are, uh, that we are going to discuss this issue. The importance of this session is actually, this is the one where we achieved the full uh, diversity in terms of Turkish, Turkish Cypriot, Greek and Greek Cypriot uh, diversity in a session. So I hope everybody will enjoy and our students and followers will benefit from the discussion. Nasojan, uh, the floor, the screen is yours. <coughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. I hope you are all fine. Uh, in my presentation, uh, I will try to deal with mainly the non-solution of the Cyprus problem and its future prospects. You know, in the history of the Cyprus problem, uh, serious injustices have been done and important mistakes have been made. Uh, perhaps the first serious injustice was done by Britain which annexed the island by violating international law during the First World War and colonized the island even though it had never been populated by the British. The Britain used Cyprus as her property for its colonial interests and didn't leave the communities on the island on their own. After the Second World War, uh, Greek Cyprus and Greeks demanded that the, the people of the island should determine their own future by using their right of self-determination. But their choice was the annexation of the island to Greece rather than independence. And meanwhile, some historical facts uh, also had to be taken into account. You know, the Greeks had acquired lands from the Ottoman Empire since their state was founded. And some of their gains uh, were the unfair ones received with the help of the Western powers. For example, Crete, half of whose population was Muslim and Turks, was cleared totally from those Muslim elements and with the help of the Western powers, it was separated from the Ottoman Empire under, under the guise of autonomy and was delivered to Greece. The Turks defeated the Greeks who came to Anatolia in May 1919 to occupy their lands but they left West Antares and important islands in the Aegean to Greece. And more islands were given to Greece after the Second World War. You know, Cyprus had never been under Greek or Greek Cypriot rule. It was illegally separated from the Ottoman Empire and was not left to Greece as part of the balance created by the Treaty of Lausanne. Giving Cyprus to Greece under those conditions without taking into account the significant Turkish population in the island would mean doing further injustice. The inclusion of the Turkish side in the solution of the Cyprus problem by the United Kingdom and by the United States was a fair act in this sense. Turkey had faced serious setbacks against Greece in terms of losing the Asian islands. Now it was unthinkable for Turkey to allow itself to be surrounded by Greece by giving Cyprus to that country and to leave the Turkish people in the island to the mercy of the Greek Cyprus. Another fundamental mistake made in the history of the problem was that the Western states created a unique and unworkable state system when they tried to solve the Cyprus problem. It should have been foreseen that the Greek Cyprus who reluctantly signed the founding treaties would exclude the Turks by relying on their numerical majority and power. The next mistake was to remain indifferent to the Greek Cypriot act of destroying the Cypriot state system by resorting to violence. You know, the 1960 treaties and the Cyprus constitution had been approved by the great powers, the United Nations and the international community in general. So their eradication shouldn't have been taken as an ordinary development. No serious reaction was given to this development because of the weakness of the other side and this played a role in the continuation of the problem until today. The United Nations Security Council did one of the most fundamental injustices in the issue with its decision on the 4th of March, 1964. 
you know, this UN body, which is the highest authority of the international community, uh, officially accepted the illegal government established, established by the Greek Cyprus, who destroyed the system in Cyprus by violating the Cyprus agreements and constitution. You know, other world organizations and states follow the position of UN Security Council. They considered Greek Cypriot government as the representative of Cyprus without any legal questioning. And they gave it a representative seat in their organizations or the right to open diplomatic representations in their countries. Turkish Cyprus, who were equal partners with the Greek Cyprus and the founders of the state in the beginning, were excluded from the system without their own faults and have never been taken as an equal actor in the international arena. And there is no legal basis of not recognizing the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus as a legal entity in the context of international law, but accepting the Greek Cyprus government as the official and legitimate representative of Cyprus. The inability of the Americans and other actors to overcome the Macarius obstacle had been an important factor in not creating a final solution to the problem. Macarius repeatedly resorted to deliberate violence to eliminate the Turkish presence on, I on the island, but didn't face a strong reaction and warning from the international community. Macarius also deliberately undermined many solution attempts. His intention was to annex Cyprus as a whole to Greece and to end or neutralize the existence of the Turks on the island. His determination not to give the Turks to the smallest thing resulted in the failure of many efforts that came close to a solution. He opposed even renting a military base to Turkey for 25 or 50 years in return for the annexation of Cyprus to Greece. If Makarios had agreed to a certain compromise with the Turks, the Turkish side would have been content with limited autonomy rights granted to Turkish Cyprus and a military base on Cyprus that would be left to Turkey. You know, currently, the Turkish Cypriot community holds 36% of the island, but they are isolated in the international arena, having no legal existence. The failure of the efforts to restore the previous system or create a new viable system made the problem more complex and inextricable after 1964. Turkey had faced a serious loss in the context of the balance created by the Treaty of Lausanne, but even Turkish rulers couldn't go beyond insisting on stopping the atrocities against Turkish Cyprus. They couldn't persuade others to include the re-establishment of the Cyprus system in the agenda of inter inter international community. Instead, Turkish authorities prepared of for a military intervention in Cyprus in case that the Greeks and Greek Cyprus will take an action that would enable Turkey to play its role as the guarantor of the Cyprus system. If such an action didn't take place, Turkish Cyprus would be trying to survive as a minority group who faced severe embargoes and whose hardships were not given proper attention by the international community. Turkey's intervention in Cyprus in 1974 emerged as a justified one in that it aimed to prevent the Greek junta's attempt to annex the island to Greece by launching a coup in Cyprus. Turkey's intervention opened an important door of opportunity for a permanent solution to the problem. It might not have been possible to return the 1960 system, which couldn't be restored in the 1964-1974 period. However, with the intervention of powers such as the United States, after the Turkish intervention started, Turkey could be persuaded to end its military operations and insist a piece of land which was in line with the size of Turkish Cypriot population. Then the problem could be solved permanently when Greece announced that it annexed the rest of Cyprus. Actually, this solution had been sought previously in the negotiations between Turkish and Greek diplomats. You know, it is considered normal for different communities living within the borders of the same state to establish their own separate states. The Cypriot communities were not able to come closer and mix with each other, even though they lived together for many centuries. It is unreasonable to force these communities to establish a common state now. After the end of Cold War, uh, the European Union emerged as an actor 
that could contribute to the solution of the Cyprus problem. However, the EU, which is in the best position to solve the problem with the features it has and the tools it can use, has become the main obstacle to the solution of the problem with, with its approach, behavior, and policies. Uh, the biggest mistake made by the European Union regarding the problem is that it accepted the EU membership of the Greek Cyprus as the representative of the whole Cyprus before the Cyprus problem was solved. When the membership of the Greek Cyprus site was discussed, EU statement that it would make an evaluation without considering any preconditions worked in favor of the Greek Cyprus. Accordingly, the resolution of the Cyprus problem was not brought before the Greek Cyprus site as a condition of membership. Confident of their membership, the Greek Cyprus calculated that they would become much stronger in the problem when they became a member of the EU, and they reached the conclusion that it wouldn't make much sense to work for the solution of the problem at that stage. The EU didn't question the legitimacy of the Greek Cyprus administration and ignored the fact that Cyprus couldn't join any organization according to the Cyprus agreements and constitution. This created a situation which worked completely against the interests of the Turkish side. Turkish Cyprus were not accepted to the EU, though they chose the solution. The EU has faced the awkward situation of not being able to enforce it is law in all parts of the territory of one of its members. The fact that the EU transferred a deep-rooted, insoluble problem from outside was also contrary to general tendencies of the EU. The EU has always taken a negative attitude towards the Turkish side, making the solution of the problem even more impossible. The EU didn't give a harsh reaction to the Greek Cyprus rejection of Annan plan which was supported by the whole international community, including the UN, the EU, and the USA. On the other hand, the EU didn't soften its attitude towards the Turkish Cyprus, who voted for the plan and thus accepted the solution. For example, it didn't lift or even loosen the embargoes imposed on them. In addition, the EU has turned the Cyprus problem into a factor in Turkey's EU membership process by taking a stance which contradicted with its previous attitude towards the Greek Cyprus side. In the current situation, Turkey, which doesn't open its ports and airports to the Greek Cyprus, is punished by the EU in the form of not opening eight chapters and not closing any chapters in accession talks. Ultimately, what is expected is that whether the Cyprus problem is solved or not, Turkey should recognize the Greek Cypriot administration before becoming a member of the EU. The EU uses the Cyprus problem as a tool against Turkey, which it never wants to see as its member under the current conditions. It is in the interest of the leading countries of the EU that the membership negotiations do not proceed as expected due to the Cyprus problem. However, what has been missed here is that the Cyprus problem continues to be unsolved because of these attitudes of the EU circles. The Turks remember that European powers wanted to destroy and disintegrate, disintegrate the Turkish state through the treat of Serbs after the First World War, and they helped Greece to invade Anatolia and to get undeserved benefits with the treat of Lozan. The Turks believe today that European states are trying to put Turkey into difficulties or even to break it up. With such a mood, the Turks will show all kinds of resistance in order not to lose completely an important place like Cyprus. Turkish politicians have repeatedly stated that they would choose Cyprus without hesitation if they are forced to choose between Cyprus and the European Union. Considering that the Turkish public opinion is highly nationalistic, it is difficult for the Turkish side to make serious concessions in Cyprus as long as Turkey is governed by democracy. This difficulty will be much more prominent in the periods when the EU is involved in anti-Turkish policies and acts. You know, some circles hope that the Turkish Cyprus will be persuaded to a solution with the EU citizenship carrot. 
a significant part of the Turkish Cyprus who are tired of the embargoes that have lasted for decades might accept a solution to the problem in order to join the EU. However, it has been proved that it is difficult for the two communities in Cyprus to come to an agreement on a comprehensive solution. It has also been seen that the possibility of the solution found is approved by the people in the referendums on both sides is considerably low. Regarding the future of Cyprus, there are considerably difficult issues such as land, property sharing, administration, and guarantees that the parties need to agree on. You know, given that it adamantly opposed to the favorable conditions in the unknown land, it is not clear what kind of solution the Greek Cypriot side will accept. When the nature and results of ethnic and religious conflicts around the world are taken into consideration, it is difficult for the Turkish Cypriot side to accept a solution that will leave them at the mercy of the majority. Even if a solution is produced, it is highly likely that serious crisis will emerge in the implementation phase. Under these circumstances, two realistic alternatives seem more viable. The first is the continuation of the problem in its current form without causing crisis. The absence of crisis and conflicts might be sufficient for the actors having other security concerns. Of course, in this case, Turkey Cyprus will continue to be the suffering side. The alternative is to accept the presence of the Cypriot communities on the world stage as separate states or legal entities. If the Cyprus communities are to create a common regime, then the West and EU should seriously change their approach to Turkey and Turkish Cyprus. It will not be possible to solve the Cyprus problem with a Turkey that will be permanently excluded from the EU. And it will be difficult for Turkish Cyprus who will lose Turkey as a guarantor to accept a solution imposed by Western actors. On the other hand, a solution which will be imposed on Turks will not be permanent in the long run and will serve the instability of the region. You know, the recent discovery of rich natural gas deposits in the Eastern Mediterranean can be seen as a new factor in the Cyprus problem. Hocam, last two minutes. Okay. Uh, like the involvement of the EU, this factor will also make the problem even more inextricable. Of course, if the sites care about the solution, cooperation on natural gas deposits might provide an important opportunity. Turkey, Greece, and Greek Cyprus administration have serious disagreements regarding the borders of territorial waters, exclusive economic zone, and continental shelf. The Greek and Greek Cyprus have considered that Turkey's recent deep political disagreements especially with Egypt and Israel, as well as uh, Gulf countries, have provided new opportunities for them. They have tried to create a series of coalitions and alliances that seem to be related to the operation and sale of natural gas resources, but are basically aimed at cornering Turkey. You know, two formations that, that have emerged in this context seem particularly important. The Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum, which is composed of Egypt, Jordan, Palestine, Greece, Greek Cyprus administration, Israel, and Italy, and the Philia Forum, which is composed of Greece, Greek Cyprus administration, France, Egypt, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia. You know, the states which want to fully benefit from discoveries of natural gas have to deal with problems such as the determination of maritime jurisdiction areas and the delivery of extracted gas to the appropriate customers through appropriate routes and means. Such technical problems require all parties who are related to gas reserves in the region to develop a complex cooperation process without threatening and harming each other. The coalitions that have emerged do not include all the states concerned, and it is not certain that coalition partners will be able to agree on every issue and will be able to continue their cooperation and consensus. The fact that the coalitions have been transformed into an anti-Turkish tool rather than mechanism dealing with the main issue poses a serious problem for the future of Cyprus. Exploration of natural resources by Mediterranean states and the companies authorized by them has the potential of creating serious crisis. You know, Turkey basically opposes the Greek Cypriot administration actions which violate the founding agreements of the Republic of Cyprus. 
Greek Cyprus authorized companies to seek resources at sea and try to benefit from those resources alone on behalf of all Cyprus by excluding the Turkish Cyprus, who should normally be partners of the Republic. As the extension of their previous and current attitudes regarding the Cyprus question, the EU and particular EU states such as France stand against Turkey in this crisis. However, Turkey's resolute act of avoiding serious losses in terms of military and economic security, as well as resisting injustices, will be an important obstacle both in solving the Cyprus problem in making use of natural resources. I thank you all for listening. Today. Thank you. Uh, that's okay. Uh, this was actually a good uh, summary of the event from uh, Turkish perspective. This is uh, how the issues are being seen uh, by maybe majority uh, in the media and in discussions. Uh, and this is a, a very good contextual starting point because Nasoja offered us uh, uh, what can be done, what cannot be done, and what is seen as uh, injustices. So we are going to move to Dimitri Hoca, uh, and he, he is also very well, very well informed about the debates in Greece. He regularly contacts with, I'm sure, uh, Greek academics and following the debates, uh, and he knows Turkey very well. So he's going to give us uh, another dimension on this issue. Buyurun Hoca. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, and, and the opportunity to take part in this uh, forum. I. Um, I'm sorry I missed the sessions yesterday. Uh, I, I, I wish I could follow them, but I'll, I'll find them on YouTube. Uh, this has started off as a very interesting session. I mean, you know, I, my, my approach is going to be very different because, but, but it's also very telling what uh, our interlocutor just spoke about. There's a theme of victimization that uh, everyone is wrong and one side is right. And, and that is part of the issue and the problem. And I think this pervades in some way uh, uh, across um, the four sides. I mean, we do not necessarily represent our countries, even though we have a Greek, a Turkish speaker, a Turkish Cypriot, and a Greek Cypriot speaker. But, but uh, you know, and I've always felt uh, it's, it's an issue of ontological security, something we never talk about so much, you know, the fear of the other and, and the uncertainty that prevails. And I think this has complicated the issue over time. But let me take a slightly different approach because I, I want to approach this panel uh, differently. Um, we, are, we are living, so, so, you know, focus a little bit on the Cyprus issue, but also focus on the Greek-Turkish context and the bigger regional issue uh, context and, and try to put everything into perspective the way I see it and maybe also propose certain ways forward uh, in general as, as CBMs that might lead to a solution to, to, to the Cyprus issue. So, so one is, uh, you know, we are, we are in a period of transactionalism. I, uh, we've been through it for a while uh, and transactionalism is not necessarily a very healthy thing because it means uh, realignment, rethinking, each capital rethinking its security considerations uh, because what has considered to be a given uh, before we enter into the spirit of transactionalism is not a given anymore and it's totally logical for either Ankara or Athens or Nicosia or Lefkosa in the same matter to reconsider um, what their priority should be. And, and not only are we in a period of transactionalism which has contributed maybe to the current state of developments in, in, in Cyprus and beyond but also we are moving into a period of, uh, or we are in a period of cold peace, but it's interesting, a cold peace reminiscent of the Cold War with, as opposed to two main actors, three main actors. And, and, and, and that's also interesting. If we, we also look at developments the way they are uh, ongoing right now between Russia and, and the West regarding Ukraine. And then the larger debate about, about China and, and its role. And we seem to have a, a redux of the Cold War, but as I said, one is on geoeconomic terms with the Chinese uh, and potentially what this means in terms of the of, uh, balance of power and then one in terms of geopolitical terms with the Russians which has been the traditional way to approach things and I think this is the limit of what Russia can and cannot do and it's more geopolitics as opposed to geoeconomics and so we have to consider those dimensions and therefore how they impact by, by uh, the, the Cyprus issue. Now therefore they also impact Cyprus in, in two or three ways and in many ways. One is we still have on the table this general formula of a bicommunal, bizonal, bifederal uh, uh, solution, federation. Um, but the issue is is coming down, I think uh, uh, Professor Uzu 
alluded to it also is who has the upper hand in this I think there's positioning there we we try to go to a BBF solution but who has the upper hand ultimately uh, uh, in the future shape and how that future shape is going to be designed because I think this is still basically the solution on, on the table um, uh, and, and, and here, and, and, and compounded with this is what I would call, and something we don't discuss much about, and I think maybe, I hope Neophytos might bring it up, is, is this crisis of governance that pervades Cyprus. Governance in, within the Republic of Cyprus, uh, discontent about you know in issues of accountability of uh, of the government of, on a variety of issues, and I think uh, the the citizens of the Republic of Cyprus are totally uh, have a confidence in of trust, lack of trust in their administration overall, and and the way the structure has been set up, and huge question marks also that are compounded now we see with these exchange of publications and books about what happened at Crans Montana didn't happen there uh, and I think this is all has to do with that crisis of governance and I think the same thing applies in the north uh, these were highly highly contested the presidential elections uh, that show uh, it and it's much more than the highly contested election and, and the titles of the result between Ersin Tatar and, and uh, Mustafa Akinji it's much more that has to do with ultimately um, what Turkish Cypriots and who are the Turkish Cypriots and what they want uh, for themselves within uh, uh, the Republic of Cyprus. So this is a reality we don't talk much about, but I think this is playing a role as well in the hardening in particular of positions. Um, and then there is also the EU dimension, and, and the EU dimension is crucial. Uh, it's been there. I don't think it's going to go away unless the EU uh, totally evaporates and dissipates. Um, but, but I think the EU invention is crucial because what, one of the things we forget when we talk about the EU invention, and it's, I us it's usually forgotten in Turkey, is that if we look at the membership of the European Union, primarily it's small and very small states. <laughs> small and very small states. It's not just three or four big ones which are natural state that one looks to and builds coalitions around. But why are small and very small states, out of which many have external borders, of, uh, uh, and therefore an enhanced threat perception, why do they join the European Union? And that has to do with ensuring that some of the prerogatives are also somewhat satisfied and their threat perception is reduced. And, and so uh, uh, having the EU dimension uh, without listening to what the Republic of Cyprus might want uh, or what it prioritizes uh, would never make sense uh, for, for the Republic or Greece or all the other states that right now might not be so totally invested in the Cyprus issue. But, but the EU dimension is, is crucial in that sense. Linked to this is the complexity and the link to, to the complexity of the Greek-Turkish relationship. And, and, you know, this big issue of I asked to whether uh, because it, it's, it's almost like a parallel track. There are a number of issues in the Greek-Turkish relations that do not necessarily imply, uh, that have to do with Cyprus, even though we know that uh, there's a larger context there. And, and so the question periodically comes up whether these questions can be decoupled, whether you can decouple an attempt to resolve the Cyprus issue with an attempt to deal with Greek-Turkish relations, or, or it's a question of sequences, sequencing. Does one, does a resolution of Cyprus, uh, uh, the Cyprus issue, would that help resolve uh, Greek-Turkish relations, the, the bilateral ones, or would the re resolution of the Greek-Turkish relations help resolve the Cyprus issue? But I think this keeps coming up because um, of the multitude of I issues involved, but then there's an interconnection, and, and the interconnection has to do with, uh, in particular, international law issues and law of the sea issues. So when we talk about, uh, yeah, even our moderator alluded at the beginning to, uh, um, to energy and hydrocarbons, I mean, you know, uh, definition of ex uh, exclusive economic zones and, and, and continental shelves and so on, and, and, and the whole issue the legal uh, dimension anyway of the Cyprus issue. Um, so international law norms and principles as well as as well as law of the sea norms and principles which is basically international law uh, compound both the Greek-Turkish relationship and the Cyprus issue and there's an interconnection there. So, so all I'm saying is that there's a big debate uh, uh, as to how to move forward and 
you know, as an aside here, I, I see Neophytos and Ahmed and I are members of the Greek Turkish Forum, a, a track one and a half. Uh, uh, uh, forum where we meet periodically, Greeks, Turks, uh, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots, to discuss our issues and maybe come up with some ideas that might help uh, the people uh, uh, that are running uh, our respective entities and countries. Um, but there's always a debate, even among us, the Greeks, uh, have we, uh, is, is, and I, because we had a, a recent meeting, uh, the Greek colleagues, do we need to, the issue is, should Cyprus always be part of our agenda, of, a, of the Greek-Turkish Forum agenda, where once, it's, once, the, forum, once the forum started uh, quite a few years ago, uh, Cyprus was not necessarily there. We, didn't, we did not have separate colleagues. We have them now. And then how do we move forward? And I think it's a problem I think we all have, and I'm sure our, our Cypriot friends here too uh, do think about this as well. So I'm just saying that there is a linkage, uh, but then again, maybe there isn't, and, and so and because we are in a tense situation, both with regard to Cyprus, but also both with regard to Greek-Turkish relations, we have to consider this. Then there's a wider issue, and I think the regional approach, because it, and I try to call it a, an arc of tension or instability stretching from the Black Sea region all the way down to the Middle East. Uh, and, and, and, and the reality is we are in a, at a time when the compartmentalization of issues, of Cyprus issue and Greek-Turkish relations uh, as separate from anything else happening in the world is almost a no-go anymore. And, and we look at this arc of tension, in particular one country, uh, two countries play a role in all of this, I mean, in terms of their geography, but in particular Russia is the one country. Uh, and, you know, I live in Istanbul, I have a colleague uh, here at Kadir Has University, Serhat Guvenc, who, well, with a lot of friends of his, always takes pictures of, of Russian ships going across the Bosphorus every day. It's a reminder, you know, of how, how many ships go back and forth, uh, in particular. A reminder of how important the straits are and where do they go? They go across the Aegean, to the Eastern Mediterranean, to their base in, in the Middle East, in Syria, right? And, and so that relationship is out there and other, undoubtedly, given, given Russia's um, frequent uh, presence uh, in our part of the world, uh, this also implies, because of geography uh, as well, a, a relationship with how Turkey deals with it as well, right? It's both a Black Sea state and it's also uh, an Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean and a Middle Eastern country, among other things. So, so there is that arc out there, which is also interesting because it brings in a number of extra regional stakeholders with vested interests. They've always been there, right? The Americans have always had an interest in both regions, but here you also, you know, all of a sudden, or not sound all of a sudden, it's been happening for a few years now, but you have an enhanced Russian interest in our part of the world, more evident, it's always been there, but more evident. The Chinese dimension is there, uh, and, and, and then we, you know, the EU is there, even though I, I consider the EU not to be an extra regional stakeholder, but many others might do. But then we see how individual EU member states also have an enhanced uh, presence in, in the region. Um, and, and so, you know, France and others. So how do you, how do you account for all this? Um, and, and, and the problem here is, I think from an EU perspective, it is, is, is the lack of, of a strategy. Is EU policy and strategy toward the region defined by successive European Council conclusions? Uh, is that enough? Conclusions regarding uh, Turkey, regarding uh, Cyprus, regarding the Eastern Mediterranean, or uh, does the EU need something more than that, which is a strategy? And, and, and hence the issue is the inability of the EU at this stage to define one, because foreign policy making in the EU is made in the national capitals. Never mind the fact that we're trying to have a common foreign and security policy, it's national capitals that are the primary actors, uh, because we have not been able within the EU to move beyond uh, the unanimity issue. And, and after all, as I said, from the moment you have small and very small states, somehow they are there uh, to enhance their security. And security not necessarily in military terms, but in legal terms, moral terms, economic terms, and so on. Um, so, as long as the EU does not have a strategy per se, which is a strategy to replace or allow for the possibility that, that uh, Turkish accession might not be in the cards, because right now this is the framework, it's Turkish accession, but you have different EU institutions, uh, 
dealing with Turkey differently. You have the transactions on the European Council and you have the very legal uh, and institutional process of the European Parliament, which says, I, I judge Turkey on the basis of the fact that it is, it is a candidate for accession. And, and, and the Commission is an, has an obligation to come out with its, with its reports every year, right? And, and so, you go, wait a second, what, what approach applies? Don't we need a strategy? But we're not necessarily there yet. But the EU might be getting there because the same dilemmas, the same issues come up right now in dealing with Russia. And, and, and, and, and, uh, and I think what the, the, the EU might need to come up with a strategy uh, also as it's going forward with its strategic compass, which means doing more in terms of defense, also as NATO is re rewriting its uh, strategic concept so for 2030, and that's, that's going to be coming out soon. So, so one may need a, a, um, a strategy. Linked to this as well is, is you know, from an Athens perspective, I think in particular, where Turkey is going and what it's doing. I mean, yes, Turkey has, is becoming more and more an autonomous actor, even though it has not shown that it's you know, willing to break totally with the West. It is uh, a full member of NATO and still officially a, a candidate for accession, a country that's negotiating its accession, even though it's frozen. But nevertheless, in this wider game and this inter-regional approach where we link, we, we, if I were to look at the world, and as I said, from the fact that we have three major poles, it's two actually, and I think Russia trying to hang on in geopolitical terms. Um, Turkey is, is trying as a, as a middle power plus, I would call it, uh, in terms of its reach and approach, both a geoeconomic sort of... Uh, to be a player in the geoeconomic dimension and both in the geopolitical dimension. But, but that also means, just like uh, uh, it might find a obstacles along its course, in particular we see this uh, dealing with the US and other EU or NATO member states, likewise it has obstacles to face uh, with Russia and China. You know, I mean, if you try to, to, to expand your reach in other regions, for example, the Central Asian countries, on the basis of uh, uh, um, historic links with some of the Central Asian countries, you are going into where China's interest might be, and I'm not sure the Chinese would be totally interested. Likewise, uh, the Turkish presence in the Caucasus, which has been there anyway now, now it's more marked, might not be necessarily, or greater presence in the conflict with Ukraine, might not be necessarily something that Russia would like. So, so we'll see what this means, but, but the transactionalism itself is having a negative impact, I think, on as we move back down to our topic, which is, which is uh, uh, resolving the, the Cyprus issue. So how do we move forward? And I, I, yes, and, and how, instead, of, instead of, you know, trying to go back and look at uh, historical wrongs and rights, I try to look at where we are right now and how we move forward, right? Uh, just like the trilaterals are reality uh that that the turkey might not be happy about and those are moving forward right because there's i think there's even a cypriot uh, uh uh a cypriot proposal that there's some sort of secretariat of these in in in uh, nicosia uh which again uh i, I was in an in, a, in another webinar recently with an israeli colleague saying that israel likes this idea because it would allow israel for example to start informal dialogue with Lebanon, something you cannot really do officially. But this trilateral framework, if once the different representatives of trilaterals meet, it allows them informally to do this, which is very interesting because we never think that other dimension and other things happening. Um, just like the Ismet Gas Forum or the Philia Forum, I don't think these are going to go away anytime soon. Uh, even though, if I might say, they might be seen as anti-Turkish, uh, in this, and it's, which is basically a response to the perceived Turkish threat. On the other hand, if one carefully looks at the statements of officials behind this fora, uh, Turkey's welcome provided it's perceived to play by, by the same rules uh, of the participants. So how do we move forward? And I have a couple of suggestions, and I think these are more like, uh, you know, CBMs. Um, one is another forum. <laughs> I, I've written about it recently. I wrote about it in Tanea uh, last Saturday, and something I've been thinking about is something uh, a Black Sea economic cooperation uh, uh, organization for the Eastern Mediterranean. 
You will know the BSEC, its secretary, is based in Istanbul. It's been around since 1992. Again, as countries at the end of the Cold War were reconsidering the security priorities, and that, that meant that Ankara and Moscow got together and said we need to form something regionally, and it included other countries, and it's now an organization with 13 countries in a region that, mind you, is much more complicated than the Eastern Mediterranean. I mean, apart from recognizing or not the Republic of Cyprus, we do not necessarily have the tensions that are existent in the Black Sea region, where we have more and more conflicts that have to do and direct violations of sovereignty and territorial sovereignty and, and so on of, of other countries. Uh, but nevertheless, this organization, which is deemed not to have done much, in, on the other hand, on issues of low politics, has been working hard in making sure that, you know, in, in terms of transport and communications and, and, uh, and uh, tourism and other factors that unite the regions. It is, it's trying to enhance at a regional level uh, anything that has to do with, with these issues of low politics. And maybe this is something that we might consider. And here for me, Athens and Ankara should sit down as they actually have an ongoing positive agenda underway. Uh, we've had successive meetings of their deputy foreign ministers at least three times over the last few months. The Greek Minister of Tourism was recently in Izmir meeting his Turkish counterpart with a big delegation. The Minister of Migration was recently in Ankara meeting the Minister of the Interior with a huge delegation. So why can't we think of something which is regional again, another forum, so it's not the Ismet Gas Forum, I don't think that's going to go away, uh, or the Philia Forum, but it it's deals with low politics issues as we are slowly moving into a green economy, as we are moving into, um, uh, you know, renewables and so on. The second thing is, we need to be inspired by other, you know, and, and they need to change other paradigms. What did we just find out recently, linked, uh, connected to the Abraham Accords? So, Israel and Jordan just signed an agreement uh, a couple of weeks ago, so that Israel would provide water because it desalinates it, and it's an expensive to Jordan, that Jordan needs it. And in exchange, Jordan would provide solar power, solar energy to Israel, which Israel to meet Israel's needs. And this solar energy, even though even though Jordan is not a part of the Abraham Accords, but the solar energy would be financed. There's a huge uh, Emirati money that's going to build an enhanced plant in the Jordanian desert. So Emirates are a part of the uh, Abraham Accords to feed and to meet Israel's energy needs. And all of this is happening without resolving the Palestinian issue, which is very interesting. This is a changing paradigm, right? So how is, is there something for us to learn from that, that would allow us to move forward? How come they have been able to move and do these incredible things, which we were deriding at some stage, Trump and his administration, but it's incredible the connections that are being reinvented. And, and, and, and the reality is this, it's, it's actually water and energy. This is the real thing that bind the people in these countries, never mind how they like each other or not. Uh, so is, is there something out there for us to learn, lessons learned? Last one and, minute, I'm sorry. Yes, to yes. So, and I think this is exactly where we stand right now, because, because as the transactionalism is increasing, as the perception, at least from Athens, and I assume from Nicosia and many other European capitals, and, and not only European, there's a big question mark as to where Turkey is going, and this increased, increased uh, uh, uh, exportation of domestic, the domestic context into its external relations. Uh, we know, as I ask scholars, that there's a correlation between domestic politics and, and, and external relations of a country, but we see this exportation even more and more. And as we go towards slowly uh, the elections and beyond in Turkey, so which means that we, go to a, we could go to a breaking point, but also potentially it allows us to rethink about redoing things, coming out with solutions uh, where the regional states uh, uh, take the lead, uh, and I don't think any of the things that I talked about, whether it's a BSEC, for lack of a better term, it would be an East Med, the Economic Forum, or whatever we can call it, um, where regional states are involved, is something that none of these countries would want. I think it's something that all would want, because it would allow for all the literal states, plus some others, to take part, and also to be really be inspired by some of the other developments. Uh, because if, if these things were not happening, if we had no Abraham Accords, we would be again in a situation as we are right now facing in, in, in the greater Black Sea region. So uh, I'll sort of stop here. And, and the reason I am saying all of this is, again, I'm not dealing with 
the Cyprus issue per, uh, per se, but I'm trying to put it into context because all these developments are having a direct impact on how we're going to move forward, right? So I'll stop here. And thank, thank you, Ojan. Thank you for your uh, intervention and presentation. That was actually uh, excellently contextualized the issue by uh, referring to Russia, the problems in the Middle East. And I think uh, when we come to Ahmed Oja, everything is coming like a snowball effect, all issues. Maybe he is going to change some parts of his speech before he starts to talk. Uh, I took some of uh, I took some notes, but I'm going to ask uh, questions, uh, maybe the audience also uh, at the end, uh, because you touch upon the some of the issues that also were discussed yesterday, and which reminded me that how important they are. So we can discuss this uh, during the Q&A. Ahmed Ojan, the floor is yours. Normally 15 minutes, but we go up to 20. So Thank you so we, much. When we come um, to 15, I will uh, remind you that... It's yes, different. thank you. Um, in fact, uh, uh, dear Dimitri uh, sort of uh, stole the camera. Uh, and um, um, I, the way I start looking at Cyprus issue is not from a micro level, but I start from putting it into the uh, greater context um, to regional as well as global context and try to understand um, the impacts uh, between different levels. Uh, so I will use a macro to micro zooming in my analysis, uh, because I believe that if you start looking at Cyprus problem from within, it will give you a very myopic and very narrow um, view. So in terms of global trends in the last 10, 15 years, um, we have seen a, a rise of populist politics all around the globe. Um, the Trump America or the Brexit United Kingdom um, and there are many other examples in the world. And one of the um, effect of this was a kind of rift between uh, United States and Europe, especially during the, uh, the Trump era. So the traditional Western alliance started having some value-based crisis. All right, and this created this rift, as I said, between United States and um, um, uh, traditional European allies. And even after the election of uh, Biden, that rift has not been completely erased, I would say. Uh, now, some, what are some of the characteristics of um, the populist politics. Well, first of all, they are anti-establishment, they are anti-institution, uh, not just international institutions like United Nations and NATO and, and whatnot, but when it comes to populist politicians, they are not really keen on their own institutions, including courts or including parliaments. Um, and so we have also seen a kind of democratic erosion on the global level uh, in the last 10, 15 years. Um, meanwhile, on the global level, um, a new power configuration, as I like to call it, uh, started to uh, shape. There is this relative decline of United States and uh, relative rise of China, and maybe less relative, but again, rise of uh, Russia. Um, now, it has this new power configuration has also regional implications uh, on the Middle East, on the East Med. Um, I, I just mentioned this rift between United States and uh, Europe. When we zoom into Europe, for example, from the global level to regional level, what, what important things have we seen? Well, Brexit is one of the important developments which created a kind of vacuum. And that's 
That's why it was not accidental or random that we started seeing some actors like France being more visible and being more assertive in the European geography, as well as in the Middle East, as well as in Eastern Mediterranean. So in a way, there is this new power configuration also reflected to the Middle East, to Eastern Mediterranean. And in a way, things are all up for grabs. That's why we started seeing the, some of the related actors being, again, more visible and more assertive in the region. France, although it's a Mediterranean country, it's not an Eastern Mediterranean country, but it, was, it, it has been more visible, both in the Eastern Mediterranean as well as in the European geography, trying to, for example, fill the void that uh, the UK created. Turkey has been more active and more assertive in the Eastern Mediterranean, where they, they have seen this new power configuration. And rather than sticking to traditional, uh, traditional alliances, as Dimitri nicely put it, it has been more transactional. So we have seen Turkey, for example, uh, as I said, being more assertive and visible. As an also kind of re result, not just to this uh, new power configuration, but as a result and reaction to a rise of a new block in this region in front of Turkey. The block consists of different configurations, but includes, for example, the Greek Cypriot dominated Republic of Cyprus together with Greece, forming uh, more cooperation agreements with Israel or um, with um, Egypt. And while Turkey is having uh, problems, serious problems with these uh, countries. So um, it came to a point in the last years that Turkey started feeling more and more isolated in this very region. First, you know, the, the government called it uh, um, valuable um, loneliness, but this valuable loneliness started to create some problems some fait complice that Turkey tried to prevent. And that's how we see, for example, steps, uh, both, uh, uh, demo uh, both uh, um, diplomatic steps as well as military steps. One example to diplomatic step is uh, the signing of a uh, deal, um, a memorandum with Libya regarding the uh, delineation of the maritime issues. And then um, using more military steps like preventing the Italian ENI from drilling in the waters surrounding Cyprus. Um, a kind of combination here. But, um, you know, it's, it's not really uh, solving the problems, but it's uh, the the, the steps Turkey is taking is in a way preventing or um, uh, uh, uh, or, or, or spoiling the type of game that the other actors are, um, uh, are preparing for Turkey. The key here, the, whatever I wanted to say at the last, I should say it now, the key is engagement. I mean, uh, with only um, uh, unilateral or without a comprehensive uh, move that includes all the actors in the region, you cannot solve problems there. You can probably prevent solving uh, um, uh, problems, which I'm going to come back again. Um, there are, of course, other uh, factors as to why we came to where we are today. Uh, for example, um, the changing of the traditional discourse by Turkey on Cyprus issue from a uh, supporting a uh, bi-zonal, bi-communal federation to what they call now the new policy of cooperation of two 
equal sovereign um, um, sides. The reason was partly what I have explained that came from all those um, global as well as regional developments, but now zooming into Cyprus, there are some other factors which led, I think, to, uh, to this new policy. I'm not, by the way, um, evaluating whether this new policy is right or wrong or, or, or rational or irrational, but um, the Greek Cypriot leadership stance since the um, since the Anand plan, um, and also uh, in the last uh, run up to uh, the collapse of Grand Montana, um, created a kind of exhaustion as well as a kind of frustration in Turkish foreign policy makers. Um, the way they perceive this is that, okay, we have been cooperating, we have been supporting a bizonal bicommunal federation, but look, it's the Greek Cypriot leadership, which is like in 2004 and then in Grand Montana, they walked out from the negotiation table, uh, uh, so, so to speak. Um, are they really ready to share power with the Turkish Cypriot um, community on the island. So in a way, that frustration also led to some reactions uh, by Turkey. And one of that reaction is this change of at least discourse on the traditional Turkish foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Cyprus, from a bizonal, bicommunal federation to uh, equal status of two sides. Now, is this a radical move? Is this a radical departure of Turkish foreign policy from its traditional policy vis-a-vis -vis Cyprus? Or is this a strategic move to force the other side to sit, to negotiate a bizonal, bicommunal federation based on real political equality of the two communities? There is a question mark, I'm not so sure. So let me, let me rephrase. Is this a radical departure that Turkey is not going to go back to Turkey's side, not go back to a bizonal, bicommunal federation? Or is this, as we say in Turkish, literally translating, showing the death and getting the other side to accept malaria. Death meaning two states, um, malaria being uh, a bizonal, bicommunal federation. It's not clear yet. It depends on um, where Turkey's relations with the United States and with European allies are going to shape in the coming months and maybe coming years. Um, are we going to be able to uh, escape from this transactionalism? And uh, are we going to enter into an era where traditional um, institutional alliances will matter again? Certain values will matter again, uh, yet to be seen. We have seen also um, um, this retaliation by the Turkish side um, on the Varosha issue, the step that they took to open part of uh, uh, Varosha. The Turkey's uh, open um, um, support to Mr. Tatar during the presidential election. It all shows, uh, so in a way, as Dimitri put it, um, all these regional, starting from global, but regional developments, what I call this new power configuration, they all influence Cyprus issue. So it's not just the internal dynamics within Cyprus, but all these uh, are important. Um, there is, in, in general, a lack of correct alignment of stars currently. Uh, but can we actually 
establish uh, that uh, uh, alliance of stars? I don't know. Um, I don't know um, in the in next few months, I don't see it possible. But I think the key um, in solving Cyprus problem, many years ago, more than 10 years ago, I coined the term and I called it Belgiumization of Cyprus. What we need is Belgiumization of Cyprus. And, in, and I, when I voice this in conferences, a lot of people sort of mock me, telling me that, oh, professor, you got it wrong. Belgium is not a good example of federation. And, you know, my response is that don't um, insult my um, intelligence. I've been to Belgium so many times, maybe 20 something times. I know that it's a very difficult to run federation. But nonetheless, let me remind you that several years ago, after the general elections in Belgium, remember for more than 400 days, they couldn't establish a government. And my question is, what happened to Belgium? And I think the answer is very important, very telling, nothing. Belgium was not flushed down the toilet simply because the, the Flemish and the Walloons couldn't establish a government. The state continued. And I said, isn't that great? You might have some problems, you might have some differences, uh, but you don't kill one another. And the institutions, the state continues. This is what I see that should happen in Cyprus. I'm not saying, and I'm not naive to say that if we manage to establish a federation in Cyprus, that next day, you know, all Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots will embrace and love, love and hug and whatnot each other. They don't have to, but they have to respect the culture and uh, identity of the other community and that the institutions and the legal system should be ethnically blind. Once those institutions are there, I think there is a way to go. So the key is engagement on the regional level as well as on the local level. Turkey also needs to be engaged um, um, in the Eastern and Mediterranean um, um, initiatives, what Dimitri mentioned, uh, Filia Forum or the uh, um, Ismet Gas Forum. And, and, and if those are not really um, pros prospectively promising, then maybe a new form where law politics issues could be discussed, but engagement is the key. As to Cyprus, I think Cyprus can also can play a, a triggering, a key role. Um, solving the Cyprus problem can actually unlock many other issues related to Eastern and Mediterranean. And I think the way to go is this. We need, time, I know, we need a time restricted solution based negotiation process so that we do not fall into the vicious circle of unending negotiations four years ago, uh, for that, that we have seen many years ago. So this time, the Secretary General should put a kind of uh, precondition. I know that his mission of good offices doesn't include putting this precondition, but he can do this behind closed doors when he met with the sides to start the negotiations. And I, an informal precondition that this time uh, negotiations should be time restricted, solution based, with a goal of reaching a strategic agreement. Now, it should be similar to Cran Montana. There should be an international conference, but different from Cran Montana, this time, instead of two negotiation tables, there should be three negotiation tables. Number one is where the two Cypriot sides negotiate the internal aspects of Cyprus problem. 
power sharing, property, um, uh, uh, territory, EU affairs, economic affairs, number one. Table number two is security issue and guarantees where it includes two communities as well as the two uh, guarantors or the three guarantors, UK, Greece and Turkey. But this time I also propose a third table and it could be an informal table which brings the two sides as well as Turkey and Greece to the table to discuss and reach in parallel to a solution, at least a gentleman's agreement on how to delineate, how to draw the border of maritime issue between Turkey and future uh, Cyprus uh, United States. So that that issue is not left after a solution because that can create a lot of problems. And also, if this is included in the Cyprus um, negotiations, this can also be uh, uh, uh, this can also provide an incentive to take um, uh, necessary flexible actions on the, the issue of uh, uh, security and guarantees. So those are my two cents. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ahmed Hoca. Uh, Neo, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, er Erhan, uh, for this, uh, and, and, so, uh, and, and Ahmed, for this brilliant uh, idea of organizing this uh, um, uh, highly timely uh, uh, event. Uh, the, the beauty of uh, being the last speaker in the panel is that uh, I could um, uh, draw on some of the insights uh, of, of colleagues who have already uh, spoken uh, and, and adjust my presentation accordingly, I'll be structuring my presentation around some of the uh, survey findings uh, that uh, uh, we have um, uh, accumulated over years, uh, at the same time trying to respond to some of the uh, questions or raise new questions on the basis of what uh, uh, my, three, uh, my three esteemed colleagues uh, have uh, uh, talked uh, about. And, and following uh, straight directly from Ahmed's uh, insights, uh, I agree there is a macro picture of the Cyprus, so the micro picture of the Cyprus uh, uh, questions. And where we converge uh, with, uh, with Ahmed is that on the one hand, you have the manageable risks of federation, risks that are local, where it will be very specific to Cyprus, and according to international experience, they are resolvable. And on the other hand, you have this unmanageable, wild, regional, international uh, environment where you don't know exactly where the Cyprus uh, problem would land. Uh, even in the next, uh, we're not talking about decades, so it's a changing landscape of geopolitical relationships, changing uh, almost every month uh, in the region with a direct consequences uh, to, uh, to the two communities. To put it more bluntly, Cyprus is the weakest link in the geopolitics of the region. If there's any sort of crisis, major confrontation of the region, Cyprus is essentially gone. And we don't know uh, what, what, what, what will happen to either of the two communities. We're the weakest link. And, and, and I think we're, uh, we're very interesting in terms of public opinion. How, how, do, how do Cypriots see this polarization? Uh, in international, uh, in international, uh, in international relations, this happened. Does it make it more dovish? Does it make it more, more, more, more hardline? As this is some of the uh, very interesting questions that public opinion can um, answer. Public opinion research can answer. So, look at the cyber from international uh, security. Uh, uh, this is a paper where we're trying to identify with colleagues um, uh, zones of agreement between the two between the two communities. And the key questions here is that can we can convergences be identified on the Cyprus uh, question? And more importantly, can these convergences be uh, accepted from a public opinion uh, perspective, from a citizen uh, perspective, looking again at, at, at Grand Spontana as a point of uh, departure, the, the Guterres package. Um, what is very interesting here in terms of the debate that I follow uh, yesterday, the very interesting interventions by the two mediators, is the question of the federal arrangement. Uh, whether uh, we, we can have convergences in public opinion in terms of a future uh, federal uh, arrangement, or is it, from a public opinion uh, perspective, is it is it over? The second is, 
uh, the, the, the answer that Mavroyanis gave uh, to this question is whether this is primarily related to the security architecture. So if we fix the security architecture, do we get uh, a, federal, uh, a federal arrangement? Uh, Ahmed mentioned the question of polarization. And the very interesting finding in many of the surveys is that even Cypriots, um, uh, even though we have escalations in, in, in, in, the, in, in, in the region, Cypriots perceive those as threatening to themselves, as, as, as, as very severe. Uh, and they themselves understand in both communities. Uh, one of the findings is that, uh, is that uh, they themselves understand that they, they should adopt more dovish uh, politics. So uh, e even though we have this um, rising in polarization uh, worldwide, uh, we're talking here about a small island uh, where there's a lot of experience with past conflict. And, and, and, and maybe people think in more dovish terms when they see those, uh, those escalations, regardless of what the leaders, uh, regardless of what the leaders do. There is some kind of hope when it comes to public uh, opinion. And the third issue that emerged both in the presentations of the mediators, but also in the discussion today is what kind of trade-offs can we uh, think of uh, in, in the future? Um, uh, and, and, he, and, and here the question is, um, if you have uh, so many uh, issues that um, uh, the two communities uh, are facing, uh, can we think uh, of win-win of, of uh, uh, trade-offs uh, between the two? Professor Oslo mentioned the different issues. Uh, and, and any of them can sink the vote, right? Any of them can mean that, uh, that we cannot reach a settlement on the Cyprus issue. But if you put them all together, maybe they can be some kind of um, uh, package that can satisfy both communities. So this is what we're researching. Uh, in terms of the hypothesis, uh, I mentioned security already, you know, creating this credible commitment um, situation that uh, uh, both, uh, both sides, if they feel secure, more likely to make concessions on other issues. Uh, there are questions of reparations in Cyprus for those who lost their properties or those who might lost properties that they have been uh, living uh, in for the last 50, 50 years? How do we compensate that? So there is a forward-looking approach, but also looking at the past where people are coming uh, in this conflict. We're not, try we're not trying to reduce uh, the, the, the, the conflict in, in terms of um, uh, its um, emotional and material importance. You know, the question of reparations, restorative justice is very important. Uh, can we create a mechanism that satisfy that in the negotiations? The questions of legacies, you know, how past negotiations impact on, on future uh, negotiations. Um, uh, and, and of course, there is a, an overarching uh, hypothesis that these type of, of, of survey experiments and public opinion uh, uh, research uh, trying to, to cover. Um, the, the broad hypothesis is where the Cyprus problem is, is, is resolvable and, and, and where could it be? Uh, resolve under, and in, in, in which type of, of setting. Um, there's an argument that Cyprus is a diplomat's graveyard, essentially. And because of the differences among the various issues, uh, we cannot uh, reach, uh, reach a settlement. So we're trying to test that, that, that hypothesis uh, uh, as well. Uh, if there's no zone of possible agreement in terms of public opinion, then the chances of the likelihood of solving the Cyprus problem are lower. But if we can identify win-win packages in the two communities, uh, then we have a, a good starting point. Uh, public opinion is not sufficient, obviously. We know we're not naive. Uh, we understand the broader geopolitical context uh, that Cyprus is located, but it's, it's often necessary uh, to, uh, to start thinking about um, uh, a resolution uh, for, for, for, for, for, for, for the problem. So is Cyprus at the diplomat grave? Yes, or is it is still a hope? So this data were collected just before the pandemic. Uh, there was a broader questionnaire about um, demographic attitudes and attitudes to the Cyprus problem. And then uh, each uh, respondent was given five hypothetical packages uh, to choose, uh, to, choose uh, to choose from, and they also uh, said whether they're going to be voting for those. So here is a, the, the full wisdom of the Cyprus problem, what we've been wo working for the, all of us for the last uh, few decades. Um, um, uh, Dimitrios mentioned uh, my um, uh, uh, interest on, on, on, on, on political issues and on power sharing. And uh, the first issue was, was the federal 
uh, executive, um, where we have a presidential, a parliamentary system, semi-presidential system, all these with some element of political, uh, political equality, so the different options there. Uh, there were options about territory and, and where there are different parts of um, territorial uh, adjustments, uh, how those will be uh, arranged in the future. Uh, settlements. Uh, the the, the, the Turkish Cypriots and the Greek Cypriots were told that they will keep their properties uh, that they used to have in 1974 or they got uh, after 1974. But if this is not possible as part of the settlement, if they don't get their first preference, there should be a level of compensation. So we're, it was the first time in a survey, as far as I know, that or in negotiations that we give a very precise figure so of what uh, people would get in terms of uh, compensations, there were implementation mechanisms, a security issue, uh, who will guarantee the, uh, the settlement uh, in terms of which countries or international organizations. And then what happens is that everything fades. Um, the question of managing the risk of federations that uh, Ahmed has alluded uh, to uh, in, in, the Belgian, uh, in the Belgian case. And all these are informed by uh, the Cypriot negotiations, previous peace plans, international uh, international international experience. So in terms of how people were presented those, uh, our software randomized those uh, options. Uh, they were given five different dimensions, different, different values. And, and that uh, allows us to test in both communities um, uh, with representative samples face to face uh, um, and, and, and, and reconstruct uh, the different, uh, the different, uh, the different uh, results in our findings. So uh, very, very quickly what we found uh, if you look at this, this, this, this, this, um, uh, this table, anything that is close to zero doesn't make a change uh, in, uh, public, uh, in public opinion. It doesn't reduce the likelihood of people choosing and voting uh, for that particular uh, option. Anything on the left uh, reduces the support. Anything that is orange is Turkey Cypriot. Anything that is black uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is Greek Cypriot. Uh, so, so one could see, for instance, when it comes to different elements of power sharing, that people, uh, the two communities are very close to zero. The, the, the power sharing uh, aspects that are very important for us uh, as academics, but also the politicians, are not so important when it comes to public, uh, to public opinion. Uh, on the contrary, when it comes to territory, uh, you can see there is split. Uh, it's very interesting, for instance, that when it comes to Morpho, uh, Giselio, they, they, they, they, it reduces 11% from the Turkish Cypriot support, and that's 11% from the Greek Cypriot support if Morpho goes uh, to, the, to, the, to, to the Greek Cypriot. So you can see here um, the two communities being divided, which is expected because territory is, uh, is, uh, is, is fixed on the island, but it's not sufficient to sink the boat because there are the compensatory uh, elements that could be bring in, including a solution to more for itself, find a way to constructively create federal areas, an idea that was, I think, introduced in, correct me, Ahmed Montbelerand uh, before Franz Montana uh, by, the, by the Turkish Cypriots. And then you have um, compensation. Both communities agree on higher compensation. That is a question of who will pay those compensations later on and how we finance those. And that's where the, the next panel can offer us a solution. Uh, when it comes to the natural gas, but the more we address the concerns of individual citizens who feel rightly uh, or uh, so uh, victimized by what happened in 1974 or before, uh, the more we increase uh, the level of uh, level of support. Uh, very interesting when it comes to security. Again, we have this split uh, when it comes to um, uh, uh, the very sensitive issue of Greek and Turkish uh, guarantees. But if we find a, a, a, an international type of arrangement, including NATO, very interestingly, uh, then we uh, reduce uh, the uh, divergence between the two, uh, the the two, uh, the two communities. There are there creative solutions such as establishing an international court, a UN court in Cyprus uh, that deals with the Cyprus conflict as well uh, uh, and, and arbitration. Uh, those increase also the level of support uh, for, the, for the settlement. So if, if one looks at them, uh, different, uh, the different, uh, the different uh, simulations here, we reconstructed the Anand plan, uh, or what we consider something close to the Anand plan, that gets an overall support around 39%. And then we reconstructed the Guderes package, which is about to get the majority uh, in, the two, in the two communities. But then we said that this is deal one and deal two uh, that um, uh, has the potential 
to cross the 50% barrier on both communities. So there's a federal, the federal agents of the past that were suboptimal in both communities. And there are new deals that can be reconsidered by the two communities and recalibrated along the federal lines that could be win-win and bring in majority support uh, on both communities. And, and those, to summarize very quickly, uh, they, they involve uh, uh, higher levels of compensations for both communities, for those who are gonna be affected in the property issue. And, and it was a much more international type of solution. And the reason for this is that, if you look at the region, the simple reason for that is that the, the, the, the Greece and Turkey Cypriots found themselves in the weakest position geopolitically. Right? There's all these asymmetries. And both sides can argue that these asymmetries uh, favor the other side. But then they understand that some kind of international solution that insulates Cyprus from the region and, and provides mutual protection for both communities are more likely uh, to work on, on, the, on, on their basis. So the more internationally uh, we think in terms of the, of the solution, uh, the more likely we bring in uh, majorities on our side uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a federal in a federal statement. That's that, that's that, that's that's the bottom line of this uh, of this experiment. And I can go into the details of how this could could could work. So uh, to to sum up, um, this study suggests the serious reconsideration of the parameters of the of the of the UN. I, I think in this. Uh, uh, there is some divergence uh, in this conference, so uh, it's very clear where, where this, is, this is going to. At the same time, I, as a researcher, I don't exclude the possibility that you can run a similar experiment with other types of a peace settlement. For example, you could hypothetically think of a two-state solution with bigger return of land, with human rights for returnees, Greek and Turkish Cypriots, and two independent styles, with um, another security arrangement. But those are much more difficult and much, much, much, much more difficult in terms of international law to negotiate, to adapt, and much dif difficult to uh, present in the public opinion. So I'd be very surprised if those uh, get the support of uh, uh, majorities on both communities, but it would be an interesting experiment to, to look at and can follow the same methodology. Uh, I think we need to give a structure to the conversation of what people want and how we can build viable compromises on, on, both, uh, on both sides. Uh, essentially, what emerged from the conversation on, on, on yesterday is that uh, given the asymmetry of power in so many domains on both sides, we, we cannot push uh, each other uh, to, to accept a, a peace settlement. It cannot be a capitulation. You can't think, imagine uh, Turkey capitulating in any possible way, being the strongest power in the region, in a country with a lot of international uh, re respect, regardless of what, what, what, what happens. Uh, it's a country with the highest number of refugees uh, in the world. It's, it's, it's a global and regional player. Uh, the same you cannot imagine by two EU states, right? Uh, so <laughs> what can bring a solution is essentially win-win traders. Uh, if one wants to be realistic, it has to be through incentives. It cannot be through some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, uh, uh, capitulating type of arrangement. So we need to give some structure to, to what we're debating uh, in, in this. Uh, the same principle of win-win arrangements um, and the conjoins, the packages, uh, could also apply to Greece and Turkey with a different thing. Uh, and here, the question is where we can apply this methodology uh, but also uh, extend the negotiations to Greece and Greece and Turkey because there's a mutual benefits uh, once Greece and Turkey reach their own, uh, um, their own uh, uh, arrangements uh, in, in, in the region because of the linkages to the Cyprus problem. It makes the durability, the credibility of the Cyprus problem much more appealing uh, to, uh, public, uh, to public opinion. Uh, I, I would like to end with what... Um, um, I started the presentation and also I, I alluded in the uh, previous talks by uh, my, my, my three colleagues, uh, the micro level and how relevant is public opinion in, in Cyprus. And, and it has been mentioned in, in several of the presentations earlier uh, that uh, this is a Cyprus ownership and negotiations. Uh, there has been a, a change in the paradigm since uh, even before the Annan plan. Uh, on the importance of the local ownership uh, of the Cyprus problem. Um, 
even though the Annan plan was arbitrated by the United Nations, it was done with the consent of the two sides. So it was not an external and involuntary arbitration. And there was the understanding that would be a referendum uh, for, for, for it. So it was a Cypriot ownership for, for a long time now. And, and an extension to that after uh, the Annan plan is that we move from uh, mediation, what the UN was doing as partly med mediation, as partly arbitration to facilitation. So the UN were simply there to advise uh, the two sides. In the meantime, we build technical committees and we want to be more technical committees. So we're moving more to this direction of uh, reaching out to the Cypriots and accommodating the public uh, of public opinion. At the same time, this is not, and, and here is very interesting because history is not linear, right? This is not one direction uh, that things are moving. Uh, we have this micro level, the polarization paradigm that Ahmed has presented. And uh, the fact that new actors are added in the region as um, uh, Professor Uslu uh, has, has mentioned, the alliances that uh, Dimitrios has mentioned. So we have these new actors that are entering the Cyprus picture. And, to what extent it was Cyprus problem continue to be our exclusive Absolutely. ownership where we can discuss and we can have uh, uh, these, these, these extended dialogues. Perhaps we're running out of time and, and, and perhaps at some point my face situation that uh, we, we lose control of the Cyprus problem, we lose control of what options we have. So uh, to, to conclude, uh, the, the dilemmas here are between moving uh, uh, closer uh, to what we have been negotiating for many years and, and addressing risks that are manageable, where international experience has taught us uh, that um, uh, we can um, um, have some difficult uh, moments uh, when uh, it comes to uh, living together, which is unavoidable, because you have that even in political systems that are monoethnic. Uh, you have that in the Turkish Cypriot community uh, within its mono-ethnic structures, um, difficult moments of governance. You have that with the Greek Cypriots uh, by themselves and will continue to be present uh, when uh, we, if hopefully we reunite. Uh, but these are manageable. Uh, all face an unmanageable situation in the future that can have dear uh, consequences uh, for either one or both communities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. Thank you all for your presentations. Uh, YouTube chat box is open if the viewers would like to ask questions. And also those who are in the Zoom, Pınar Hoca, Murat Hoca, and Melek Hoca and Tarık Bey, uh, if they are interested, they can also turn on their cameras and ask their questions. Uh, I would like to highlight some of the issues that I picked from all your presentations. Then I'm going to open the floor to answer these and debate them. And some of them will be directed towards uh, some of you. First of all, maybe those uh, viewers who are uh, watching this uh, event were expecting that we will always talk about this micro, macro level and the big powers from a more realistic uh, view. Uh, but what we end up is actually uh, highlighting the importance of uh, law politics. Uh, public opinion. Actually, this was one of the points that I would make, but Neo uh, ended uh, his presentation by highlighting that, and I agree uh, with him. Uh, yesterday and before, when we were discussing the Cyprus issue, this Cypriot-owned process is very much highlighted in uh, recent mm -hmm. years. International intervention is sometimes criticized, and uh, Dimitrio Soja also underlined the importance of having a platform also discussed in law politics issue. Nasu Hoca highlighted the importance of public opinion and democracy and what Turkish government can or cannot do. Uh, Ahmet Hoca highlighted uh, disappointment and frustration uh, in Turkish Cypriot and Turkish side as a result of uh, many uh, events and hardening of positions uh, are highlighted. Respect uh, of the culture and identity of other community in the possible future federation is highlighted. Again, law politics and uh, public opinion is important here. And I remember what uh, Antonio Sanakopoulos uh, highlighted yesterday. We are discussing all these big issues, but uh, there are other issues also in the world that people are being influenced. Don't forget about COVID-19 how uh, everybody is forced to help each other. Don't forget about fires and disasters in the small island of Cyprus 
that are uh, people are living together but experiencing catastrophic events. So low politics and high politics issues, as we can see, cannot be separated each other. And also, as Dimitri Osoja highlighted, domestic politics and international politics are also uh, playing a huge role here. So uh, my first question, uh, which I also tried to ask uh, Mauro Yannis yesterday, uh, Dimitri Osoja highlighted, uh, talked about EU strategy. Uh, you know, uh, I'm going to repeat actually what I asked yesterday. Uh, before 1999, when Greece changed uh, its strategy towards Turkey, we saw uh, how uh, Turkey experienced its golden years uh, in uh, EU accession process and Europeanizing uh, Turkey. Of course, I'm not going to say that uh, Turkey today, with its current status, deserve uh, progress in EU accession negotiations. But considering uh, especially Greek Cypriot and Greek strategy and lack of uh, proper EU strategy dealing with Turkey and only dealing with the issue on migration and international security terrorism issues. Uh, do you think that this strategy is contributing to uh, Turkey's hardening of its position, both domestically and internationally in its region and its relations uh, with Turkey? This is uh, my first question. Uh, to Ahmet Hoca and uh, Neo, uh, what about the domestic dimension in Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriot side? Again, we know very well, and it is covered in uh, the media, uh, the changing position of Turkey after so many years. Uh, Turkey moved to more uh, hard, tough position in Cyprus issue. But uh, we are uh, approaching a new uh, elections. Okay, there was a new presidential elections in uh, TRNC, but there will be a new uh, government uh, is going to be formed and probably there will be a change. Uh, and properly, uh, I'm sure there is a debate in the South uh, about this domestic dimension. I would like to hear more about domestic dimension of the debate regarding the Cyprus problem. And these are my first questions, then we can move on. Dimitri Osoja, I would like to start with you. Yes, uh, hi, thank you. Um, I mean, the point is, the point I was making is that the EU currently has no strategy. Uh, it has no strategy. Uh, and, and that's because of, of the dilemma as to how to move beyond the accession process and come up with something else because of differences, uh, because of intra-EU dynamics, we might be getting to a point, I mean, we can see a lot depends on, on elections coming up both in France and Italy, whether um, the dynamics that have been formed this year, in particular towards the end of this year between France and Italy, Macron and Draghi, and, and in conjunction with the new German government, what this could actually mean for Europe, because there is a realization that, that Europe needs to start really acting up on a variety of fronts, and, and I think uh, if one followed uh, earlier this week Macron's uh, presentation of the priorities of the French presidency, it's, it's, you know, he could have been speaking as, uh, as the EU president. Uh, a lot of them were Europe, Europe, Europe, uh, highlighting a very busy agenda during an electoral period for France. Uh, but, but the realization that, uh, you know, in March, uh, I think it's in March, the strategic compass has to be voted on, uh, the, dealing with the reality of a very real Russian threat right now uh, and not knowing whether Russia is going to do something or not in Ukraine and how will the EU react and therefore forcing the EU's hand to really consider a number of issues. Um, so there is no strategy. And what we have, though, and I, what I think the successive um, the successive uh, EU conclusions are, yes, one is calling Turkey for what it considers that Turkey uh, uh, is not doing correctly, uh, but it has launched or it has basically stressed a positive agenda process. And what's a positive agenda? Because the issues you mentioned are part of the positive agenda. It's keeping channels of dialogue open. And I think at this stage is where we are on exactly all these issues. While in parallel, there is also a positive agenda process happening between Greece and Turkey that nobody talks about, but it's actually happening, right? It's keeping channels of communications open. And, and I think 
and I, I think both sides are actually doing this. I, even recently, even you know, you, you had uh, an agenda on health issues. I think there was the the Commissioner for Health, the Cypriot Commissioner for Health, talking to her Turkish counterparts. Right. So it's a question of keeping these issues open in the realization that much more unites the two sides than not. Um, and and and the fact, I think, from an EU perspective, that that Turkey. Uh, has uh, is in this process also means that uh, my interpretation is that a uh, Ankara does not want to break the links with the EU even though it might be reconsidering its relationship uh, and and uh, it sees value to them because a lot of the issues exactly as you mentioned I mean you know for Corona I have a different perspective also because Corona has made us has divided us also, we don't. People don't interact, right? We see this in Cyprus. We see this in the Greek-Turkish relationship. It's only since the last few months that we actually have air travel. Still, not boat travel. It's difficult to cross the border, and and this has widened uh, the differences between the publics at a time when uh, there have been high tensions, when there should be more interaction. On the other hand, I think when we talk about migration, when we talk about climate crisis, when we talk about uh, the green uh, economy issues uh, and the others that and and also the the, the communicate the, the the conclusions also talk about people to people contacts and enhancing them. Um, it's a realization that there needs to be interaction and and and uh, there's no other way forward. I mean, you you saw this also in the summer where when the fires broke out in Turkey, uh, it seems that the Turkish side rejected the Greek offer, an Israeli offer for help, and then turned around on this. There's no way you can reject these offers anymore. We all need each other, right? So whether we talk about Cyprus or we talk, the whole Mediterranean was burning. Uh, and, and I think I think this is where we are, but this, is, this does not make up for a strategy. This makes up for channels of communication, a realization and an iteration that there are issues there might be differences on how we approach them, but there are issues that connect us. Um, but the EU really has to shape up. And I think I, there's another Turkish colleague I've been involved in in a couple of meetings, uh, Galib Dalai, who has written and said something very interesting, which says an EU strategy, which is lacking, would actually help Turkey also know what the EU is up to, what it has to deal with. Right now, it does not because this helps transactionalism, the fact that there's no strategy. We've frozen, we've frozen accession, but accession officially is still on the table. So we can come up and keep talking about it. Yes, we want it, they don't want it, vice versa, and so on. Uh, we, you know, we keep talking about migration and the potential of, you know, the, the instrumentalization of migration, which from a Greek perspective, Greece has experienced this at least a couple of times. And now we see others, and that's why the EU strategy is necessary. Belarus has tried to do this, or Morocco tried to do this with Spain. So how do you deal with it? Uh, uh, there's also the potential, even though Turkey is less involved right now, it's, it's more Russia regarding the instrumentalization of, of energy uh, as, as a weapon. And uh, we seem not all of us are suffering from, from higher energy prices. Um, so, so I think... The strategy is the element that's missing. The problem is when you go to Brussels, and I'm involved in a project with Greek and Turkish colleagues, and, and as part of this project recently went uh, to major capitals, Paris, Berlin, and, and, and Brussels, talked to officials at foreign ministries and at the EU External Action Service. And our last trip was to Brussels, and we spoke to pretty high-ranking people in the External Action Service that have to come up with a strategy per se and are willing to and they have the wherewithal the means the capacity to do this uh, and as they come often to Ankara interact with the Turkish colleagues and they say in their frustration um, but the national capitals are blocking this I mean the EU has to deal with that real dilemma it, it's there we know that's how the EU operates uh, but, but right now this is blocking really clear thinking on the part of the EU this is what we expect from Turkey as a third country where maybe accession might not be on the table or leave accession on the table but also start focusing on other issues uh, and this uh, would help Ankara also uh, elucidate, clarify its position vis-a-vis -vis the EU on these issues and I think it would make for a much healthier dialogue and, and as long as we don't have this the temptation is to use the fact that we're in a transactional world and try to divide and rule on, on both sides uh, on all sides it's happening. 
Um, and, and these dynamics are not healthy. And, and, and just last point, uh, a couple of days ago I was in involved in a closed debate regarding uh, what's happening in Ukraine, because that's also one of my interests, uh, the Black Sea region and the dynamics. Lots of Ukrainian colleagues, lots of EU colleagues, and others, uh, no Russians, but it had to do with Russia's behavior. But it was so interesting where, yeah, an easy solution for many Ukrainians and many analysts that focus on this part of the world, Europeans, is, you know, uh, uh, well, we'll, we'll, you know, Turkey is our ally in this case, we'll have to play the Turkey card and so on. I said, fine, that's good. But, you know, you cannot detach all of a sudden the Ukrainian issue from what's happening in Cyprus, also in the Eastern Mediterranean. We need a holistic approach. We cannot compartmentalize things, you know. And, and I think uh, this is where the EU is lacking and also educating its smaller member states. Because what one might accuse the Republic of Cyprus of doing in using the EU for its own interests, one can just as easily accuse the Baltic states or some of the Central Eastern European countries of doing because their priorities are Russia and Belarus and so on. And, and to resolve that issue, they are willing not to look at the concerns of their partners, right? And, and that's why the strategy is, is necessary. But the dialogue, the, the positive agenda that, that's in place, I think it's the next best thing. One of the issues, too, I think, for the EU, and I, I, which is complicating issues, I think, is the governance structure in Turkey proper, right? We've all talked about it. At the beginning, once Turkey went through and its transition to a presidential system, you would have a number of diplomats, whether they're national diplomats or EU diplomats, knowing that they don't know exactly who, who the counterparts are. Because, you know, the foreign ministry as foreign ministry is there as an institution, but it's one of many now doing foreign policy, and its role has changed. And therefore, who do you talk to? You talk to the person I used to interact with at the foreign ministry, or do I have to find someone, a new contact at the presidential palace, and how's decision-making going, happening? And I think that in itself is also creating a number of issues, which have implications in the Turkey EU relationship and also the Cyprus issue for that matter, right? Because it keeps us guessing as exactly as to what the intentions are. I, I've spoken a lot, but I'm just trying to, yeah. You. Thank you, that was excellent, thank you. Ahmet Ojan? Mute. Uh -huh. Microphone. I'll keep that as short as possible. Um, look, when you look at the traditional sociological um, structure of the Turkish Cypriot community, um, it's clear that um, um, mostly right-wing parties or center to right-wing parties um, uh, get the support of the majority of the um, uh, society, uh, ranging from, let's say, 60% to sometimes even higher than that. And those who are situating themselves from center to left are around, let's say, 30-40%. But, um, and it is, well, not but, in addition, um, the right-wing parties are regarded as supporters of two-state solution in Cyprus, and it is usually the left-wing parties which are clearly the supporters of uh, bi-zonal, bi-communal federation in Cyprus. But in reality, the Anand plan also um, um, proved to us that those who in the general elections vote for some of the right-wing parties are also supporters of a federal solution in Cyprus. Just look at the uh, December 2003 election results. Um, uh, the pro-solution parties were around 50% at that time, but a few months later, during the Anand plan in April 2004, 65% of Turkish Cypriots supported a federal solution. Now, even in the highly debated last presidential election in the North, uh, with some uh, very obvious Turkish uh, government support to one of the candidates, the current uh, president, Mr. Tatar, it was only a small margin of one, two percent that um, Mr. Tatar gained. But that is not an automatic um, fact that 
more than half of the population do not support a federal solution. Um, I have been involved in public opinion polls on both sides of the island since 2008, uh, together with some of my Greek Cypriot colleagues, we have been doing polling on both sides. And it is very clear that um, if there is a referendum tomorrow on a bizonal, bicommunal federation, uh, it seems like, again, majority of Turkey Cypriots, 60% um, plus uh, would go to the polls and, and, and vote for a bizonal, bicommunal federation. Here, of course, the key is um, what kind of security arrangement and what kind of power sharing arrangement will be struck. Um, those will be the defining uh, two important issues, I think. Um, in terms of um, the Cyprus problem being on the agenda, unfortunately, COVID and currently the, um, the economic crisis or call it devaluation of Turkish lira play more important role in the daily lives of Turkish Cypriots. As you know, it's been uh, more than a year and a half uh, when COVID uh, pandemic started and um, it also influenced the checkpoints, um, the, the, the way the checkpoints operate. So it was last week, for example, that in addition to if you are fully vaccinated, you need a PCR test to be able to cross to the other side. Mind you that for several months, the checkpoints were closed and it is not positively influencing the Cyprus problem, but negative. The current um, uh, currency crisis, Turkish lira crisis, is interesting. It actually is, um, is occupying a huge part of Turkish Cypriots because although the currency we use in the North is Turkish lira, but you know, in reality, when you buy a house or a car, or even if you rent a house, you use uh, British pounds or, or euros. Um, and, um, you know, this is not helping much. On the other hand, very interestingly, I was crossing to the South um, two weeks ago, and it was interesting. From the Turkish side to the Greek Cypriot side, it used to be in the past, more cars passing. This time, uh, I was a minority, uh, just a couple of Turkish Cypriots crossing to the, north, uh, to the South. But a lot of cars, a lot of people from the south are crossing to the north, simply because um, the petrol prices in the north are half. And now due to the uh, currency devaluation, um, the, the, the north became a, um, a center of a, a attraction for a lot of Greek Cypriots to come and do their grocery shopping as well as uh, pharmacy shoppings and whatnot um, in the North. So, so of course we need more detailed uh, public opinion polls, uh, studies to understand how this new current dynamic is actually shaping um, the uh, public opinion. Thank you. Neo would know better than me, these things were also happening in Northern Ireland. People from South were coming to North to buy stuff uh, in the North. Yeah. No, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. The changes in the currency had uh, had uh, this uh, this impact. But I would like to mention um, a, a couple of um, uh, positives. Uh, there's enormous sympathy uh, in the Greek and Greek Cypriot public opinion uh, on and what is happening in Turkey in terms of the economic crisis. Having spent a decade in a financial crisis, deep financial crisis, people feel, and, and this is a consensus in the media, very rare consensus in the media, uh, people mentioning the crisis from the point of view of the individual Turkish citizen and, and, and the sufferer. So there's an opportunity there if there was an initiative to, to support Turkey or cooperation with Greece or EU cooperation, 
there will be a consensus in public opinion. And, and, and, and that can be taken out from the geopolitical aspect because people feel that uh, we went through that for almost a decade. So uh, uh, uh, we need to pay attention to what is happening in a, in a neighboring country and the suffering of the ordinary citizen. From the point of view of um, military, we haven't touched on the armaments, which is an important change on what is happening in the region. Maybe we could devote a, an entire conference uh, on, on this, but the bottom line there is that uh, even though Greece had managed to, uh, uh, to, to, to secure some very important contracts the past two years, it doesn't change major, it doesn't make a major change when it comes to the security architecture of the, of the region. The equation is still very similar uh, when it comes to Cyprus, for instance, when Turkey has a clear uh, military superiority, and, and Greece cares about Cyprus. Uh, Greece, Greece's we, uh, biggest nightmare is 1974, having to face a, a situation uh, where it has to protect its own self and protect a, a third country, Cyprus, and cannot do both at the same time. I mean, this is a dilemma that Greek military strategists have always been facing. And Greece doesn't want to face that dilemma again. And, and, and that's where the proactive diplomacy comes in uh, with regards to uh, resolving the Cyprus problem. So the fundamental structure of incentives uh, are exactly uh, the, the, the same as they used to be previous decades and, and, uh, and in terms of its historical, strategic, and military significance. So there we have a very strong incentive for getting a deal done. Uh, the third is that is the last window of opportunity to deal with uh, hydrocarbons in the region. Um, we have a, a record level of prices. We don't know if we're going to have them again in the future. We know that technology is changing very fast. So if there is some kind of um, potential there, we don't believe it fully. Um, none of us is, I think, naive to think that this is, this is going to happen for sure. But, but if international companies want to uh, invest and, and, and they can do it safely for the environment, and they can do it safely for geopolitics, and we can reach an agreement among ourselves uh, uh, for, for this, meaning among ourselves, the Greek and Turkish, Turkish Cypriots, we have a window there uh, to secure uh, the financing, at least, uh, of the Cyprus uh, of the Cyprus settlement, which requires the construction of the economy uh, in the Turkish Cypriot side, compensations, and, and support for the first steps of the, uh, of the, of the, of the federation. So this is the third, uh, the third element. Uh, of, uh, uh, of optimism. And the fourth one is that we have elections. This is not so much optimistic. It can turn, uh, it, it can turn into a nightmare as well. We have simultaneous elections in all sides at the same time. So how do we manage, uh, how do we manage that? And it's not only Turkey and the Greek, uh, and, and the Greek Cypriot elections. Greece also has, uh, has, uh, has elections uh, predicted probably in 2012, 2013. And a very complicated election. So these are these are these are these are these are landmark elections in all in in, in all flagship elections on our side. On the Greek side, it's interesting because Greece might be going even to double elections because of the complications in the electoral system. Uh, the, the the the parties cannot agree on what kind of electoral rules uh, we'll have to whether we keep the majoritarian electoral system uh, that, according to its advocates, brings stability or go to some kind of proportional representation that is more in line with. Uh, European political systems and coalitions uh, systems. So we might have to go through double or even triple elections uh, in, the next, uh, in the next few years. Uh, there's a clear uh, difference among political parties on major dimensions when it comes to Turkey, what we do with armaments, what we do with uh, federal arrangement in Cyprus, there's a consensus there. Uh, uh, CMPs, to what extent we support uh, an arbitration by, by the Hague. And the same dilemmas apply to all sides, right? To what extent do we support uh, these, uh, these, uh, these dimensions? Elections in the Greek Cypriot side uh, will be very interesting. Uh, most likely winners will be on the center right. Uh, but there, um, the, the center right um, uh, uh, will be forced in, into, in, in, the, in, in the elections to clarify uh, whether they, they, they will be moving uh, back to the Clearidis legacy of federal Cyprus within federal uh, Europe, or whether we're going to be departing completely uh, from that legacy and assuming a much more nationalistic type of um, uh, approach. And, and this is obviously a, a feature within the uh, 
rival candidates uh, in the in the in the in the center right the two individuals with very clear uh, approach representing uh, representing each uh, to, to what extent uh, the traditional nationalists could field a candidate very unlikely uh, maybe a girl with a moderate candidate would make a, would make the surprise but the bottom line here is that all sides are facing elections at the same time and this will be 2013 will be let's say the uh, Eastern Mediterranean referendum on what we do uh, for the for the future and we can uh, we can mark candidates and political parties according to these dimensions I mentioned to what extent they support federal in Cyprus to what extent they support arbitration on which issues uh, in uh, in the Hague to what extent they support rapprochement with the West when it comes to uh, to, to, to Turkey and resolving their issues. This will be, it will be a cathartic moment, possibly, when it comes to uh, rebuilding uh, ties in the Eastern Mediterranean. But at the same time, it can be, they can create opportunities for people to play the nationalist card and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and add more polarization, as Ahmed mentioned uh, at the beginning of his presentation. Okay. Now, Sojan, would you like to comment? I will give the floor okay. to Murat Hoca. Murat Hoca is waiting, okay. I see. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, I agree that we have to move forward and engage engagement is important. Uh, but again, uh, I feel that we have to look at uh, history, you know, to understand uh, our current situation. Uh, I will uh, mention some important events in the recent history. You know, in 1997, uh, Turkey was not considered uh, as part of uh, European Union expansion but the Republic of Cyprus uh, was accepted. Then at that time, you know, Turkey and Turkish Cyprus said that we will not talk anything about Cyprus question. At that time, you know, uh, Turkish Cyprus side said, we can negotiate after, you know, uh, our uh, regime is expected, uh, accepted by the other side. Then we see some improvements in 1990, you know, there were earthquakes in Turkey and uh, Greece and there were uh, mutual collaboration, you know, there were good feelings towards each other, you know, uh, foreign ministers of uh, both countries uh, visited each other uh, maybe after 40 years. And in 1999, again, uh, European Union, you know, considered Turkey, uh, uh, give the per uh, perspective of uh, membership Turkey in uh, at the end of 1990, but, in this same uh, meeting, uh, they said, you know, uh, we will uh, start negotiation talks with Cyprus and we will not uh, consider any precondition before. Uh, so there was good development for Turkey, but again, there were some, uh, you know, uh, negative developments. Then uh, in early 2000s, you know, AKP kept, came to power uh, and there were uh, important uh, talks about Annan plans, and Annan was trying to solve the problem before the Republic of Cyprus uh, became a member of EU, and the AKP government was new and couldn't uh, intervene uh, in at that time. But after some time, you know, they tried to, uh, you know, make those referendums. You know, as you, if you remember, you know, AKP government supported uh, pro-EU uh, groups in uh, Turkish Cyprus side, even they oppose, you know, Rauf Denktaş, who was traditional uh, leader of Turks there. Uh, so in that referendum, we see that, you know, uh, Turks accept uh, at the rate of 65%, but Greek Cyprus uh, rejects it at the rate of uh, 75%. In those periods, you know, AKP party, were really trying to make changes in its foreign policies. You know, it was trying to solve many traditional problems, Armenian problems, and they were trying to, uh, you know, be mediators between different sides in the Middle East. Uh, but we see at that time, you know, uh, there was a, a government which tried to mend fences with uh, many uh, partners. Uh, and Turkey uh, accession talks uh, were started in 2005, but the process, you know, negotiation uh, accession process was cut off in 2006 because of Cyprus. You know, Turkey was very pro EU at that time, and uh, it was trying to uh, fulfill its responsibilities. 
but just because of the Cyprus problem, the uh, accession process uh, was cut off. Uh, so some EU members uh, declared that uh, we do not want to see Turkey as member in EU. You know, France, Germany, they uh, openly declared it. So at that, I say that, uh, you know, Turkish uh, government, of course, has to engage uh, with many actors, has to uh, try to uh, find channels. Uh, of course, it still has the you know, EU uh, membership perspective. Uh, but again, uh, I think we have to look at the uh, realities, you know, uh, and uh, attitudes of especially European powers uh, seem problematic, uh, you know, from my perspective. Thank okay, you, Hocam. Thank you. Thank you, Hocam. Normally, we were supposed to finish five minutes ago, but uh, we have uh, 10 more minutes. So, Murat Hocam, if your question is going to be as short as possible and directed towards one person, I would like to finish uh, in 10 minutes. Go ahead, please. Murat uh, thank you. assistant professor in Department of Political Science and IR at Istanbul Sabahat Enzyme University. Okay, uh, thank you so much uh, for facilitating this event. Actually, I want to ask a very single uh, and very short question. It's about the strategy of the Greek side, because what I have noticed for the last 10 years, EU has become the base of the Greek arguments other than the ones of the United States. That means once there is a discussion, we shift our focus, not from the problems on the island, but what the attitude of the EU member states are, what the international law dictates without discussing exactly what article requires what. So my question is, I mean, what should be the strategy of communications in resolving this dispute? Because if we focus on exactly the structural events and also the proceeding itself, other than the you know, expected outcomes from the external actors, there's an unfair situation that communications efforts stuck. For instance, if- uh, Murat Hocam, microphone kapandı. Murat Hocam, for instance, dedikten sonra kapandı. Turkish are totally isolated. That means there is an unfair treatment of communications and strategy making process. So my question, I mean, how do you see this? I mean, why we are sliding towards international organizations rather than directly communicating am among ourselves? Thank you. Uh, anybody who would like to answer that? Or I'm going to direct the question to somebody. <laughs> Dimitrios Hocam, go ahead, please. Yeah. I don't want to direct you first because as you are the Greek member, so we are not representing our nation. So yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. But this is a very interesting question. Uh, first of all, it's a question of perspective. Um, you know, the EU is not an external actor to Greece. They, Greece is uh, they use an integral part of what Greece is, and Greece is an integral part of the EU. So it's a question of perspective, and I think this is something that many times uh, my Turkish colleagues and others do not want to understand it. Same thing applies to Cyprus. Uh, that's why, you know, in official uh, buildings or it's two flags behind. Uh, it's the EU flag together with the national flag. And so, so that's one thing. So it's not a question of, oh, it suits me to have the EU in or not. It's, it's an actor. It's a fundamental actor to the process. But more than anything, let's go beyond that. It helps shape Greek public opinion in a positive way just like it should be shaping Turkish public opinion. Because first of all, the EU as a model, I mean, we, we just go back to, you know, the, the, the Nobel Committee, why when it granted the European Union the Nobel Peace Prize in 2012, right? It's there to avoid war. It, it, it's, it's a model to avoid war and to enhance cooperation. And that logic is something that's usually very difficult for states that are outlier states, flank states, Greece. Turkey, Cyprus, to understand when they, they feel threatened by in their neighborhood. And somehow the, the, the fact that we stress this helps we governments, Greek governments stress, and I think I am a committed Europeanist and a federalist more than anything, um, helps shape public opinion in that the only way forward is with cooperation and reaching out bilaterally, regionally, and so on. Secondly, even the arguments about international law, I mean, this is also about shaping public opinion. 
this has always been the Greek policy, but it's been, if you look at statements of leaders, prime ministers across time, ever since that, uh, you know, Greece has said we, you know, we uh, support international law and then if we cannot resolve it on our own, we can go to the court or uh, to the court of justice or another arbitration mechanism. Um, the other previous leaders have said this periodically. Mitsotakis is saying this all the time. When he says it all the time, again, he's trying to tell the Greek public that compromise, there's a way forward, and there's not such a bad word, because we have a problem with compromise, all our sides. I mean, even if it was what he was saying, you know, the perception that we are being pushed into something as opposed to sitting down and resolving the issues. And that's why I always think it's very interesting. The Abraham Accords, it's a different setting, but, you know, it teaches us a few things how you can move forward. So, so, so I think there's a value also for shaping the Greek public opinion away from the more hardline positions, because the hardline positions are there, let's arm and, you know, we'll be ready and who cares about the Turks and so on, mm -hmm. to actually saying, no, no, no, no, we cannot do this on our own, we have to do this in a setting, we've learned from our membership since 1981 that the only way forward is to cooperate. Greece has also been very much humbled by its... Um, experience with the crisis. It's gone through different stages, the economic crisis, and I agree with Neofitos, the perception, uh, yes, uh, of, of how Turkey is viewed. I mean, it's people suffering. <laughs> we know about people suffering because we went through exactly the same thing uh, uh, for 10 years, and still Greece is in the crisis. But I think the EU is that exact, is exactly that, and I think it's more, it has to do a lot with keeping somehow a significant mass uh, of Greek public opinion or making them understand that there is also this, there is also this mechanism to the court. Then among experts we can debate as to how and how we're going to go and if the two sides sit down and agree uh, on what basis we're going to negotiate for what issues uh, to go to the court and get a judgment. We're not there yet, but I think this is shaping public opinion and maybe, you know, we have pollsters, I do some polling too periodically, maybe this is something to look at, whether this argument over time is having an impact. Because to me, it's reminiscent of one of the arguments I remember, one of uh, Neofitos' colleagues and, and Ahmed's, uh, Haris Psaltis, who always used to, some of the polling you've done over time has shown that ever since the border crossings opened, the percentages of Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots in favor of a solution has increased. It's not a significant mass, but that has, that has contributed. Likewise, stressing international law and the EU context, I think, allows for the moderates, for the moderates, to, to be, uh, you know, irrespective of elections tomorrow, uh, whether we have a government change, allows for the moderates to keep a position when it comes to Turkey uh, that, that might eventually lead to some sort of solution resolution. I, this is how I see it. I don't know if this satisfies you, but this is how I see it. But, I, but fundamentally, really, uh, the argument about, you know, that's why I even said in my intervention, some do not see the EU as, as a regional stakeholder. It is. You have EU member states there, it's part and parcel of what we are. It, it's a totally different mentality. But Greek governments need to say this all the time to convince also their publics. Because we feel just like the Turks marginalized, right? We feel that we are on our own many times and we need that support. So, yeah, I'll stop here. I, I know maybe Neophytos has been shaking his head, maybe he wants something to add. Or... Yeah, that was very well said. Uh, I agree with everything. I, I think. EU support is significant to change Greece to a positive direction, but but the, but but the Greek public opinion, especially the hardliners, it is a, the characteristic weakness of the Greek hardliners. Will never believe that the EU will come and help them in any sort of military confrontation. They don't they don't trust France. They don't trust United States. Uh, they, they think if there is some kind of confrontation, they will be left by themselves. That's that's the mentality of the Greek uh, of the Greek hardliners. So it doesn't make any noticeable change when it comes to confrontation, but it makes a positive uh, change on the Greek attitudes and Greek Cypriot attitudes when, when it comes to, uh, to, to, to, to cooperation. That, that said, uh, there are the traditional red lines of both sides. And the question is, what do you do with, with, with, with, with, with this? Uh, what we see in, in, in, in public opinion surveys is that the, the more international the, the settlement could be, the more likely we're gonna get endorsements from both sides uh, of, of the settlement. So from the point of view, I guess that's a question uh, for, uh, for, for, for, for, for Turkish Cypriots and the Turkish, uh, t -t Turkish uh, uh, policy makers. Um, would it be possible 
um, for instance, on issues of security, to think of third country um, uh, guarantees, to think of international organizations uh, being involved in Cyprus. Uh, is, is, is there any potential there uh, where the Turkish Cypriots can see their security uh, being uh, supported either by themselves internally through a Turkish Cypriot arrangement or in combinations with third country actors that are not necessarily involve Turkey because that creates insecurity for the Greek Cypriots. That, that's a type of, let's say, trade-off that the Greek Cypriots will accept and then allows them to make concessions on other issues, uh, in, including, uh, including uh, power sharing. Another poll that we have done uh, during the pandemic um, uh, this, this summer, we found that uh, a settlement that involves security uh, for the Greek Cypriots against Turkish interference, but power sharing for the, for, for the Turkish Cypriots uh, will win win-win support on both, uh, both sides. More than more than sixty percent on each uh, of the two uh, of the two communities. So in, in a way, there's the same challenge for the Greek Cypriots. Can we think of arrangements? Can we create traders that the Turkish Cypriots uh, could uh, come in, in, in, in, into the settlement? The same applies to all sides: Greece, Turkey. Can, can we think of something that the other side cares a lot and it doesn't involve significant concessions on our side? And therefore, we come to the negotiating table not only with good arguments that are based on international law and history. I'm sure those are, are very important and are very, very, very good in terms of starting our uh, negotiating uh, positions and starting a negotiation, but can we have something valuable for the other side uh, that will open up the space for negotiations? Thank you. Uh, if there is not anything else to add by Ahmed Ojorna Sohoja, uh, I'm going to end this session. Do you want to say anything? Okay, the time is over. Ahmed Oja is watching us uh, his watch. I would like to thank you all. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, this shows us, again, the importance of talking any issue together and try to share our experiences, opinions. Uh, we would like to see you in another event again. And in uh, kind of half an hour, we are going to have another session on energy. We would like to see you all there. Bye-bye. All the best. Take care.